The second part of this case, um, uh, we have two speakers that will, will share the podium, uh, Aaron Shakar and Rob Yates. Let me just give a brief introduction uh, for both. So Aaron will come up first, and Aaron is the Director of the Initiative on Health and Humanity, and you know him as the one of the organizers of this meeting. And he um, was the Associate Director of the Non-Communicable Disease Program at, at Partners in Health. And he's worked as a policy advisor uh, for the WHO HIV AIDS Department. Aaron uh, wor has been with Partners in Health f f for two decades. I mean, 20 years ago, was working with Jim Kim on, uh, on uh, uh, Dying for Growth, uh, a volume uh, that some of you may know, on, on, you know about neoliberalism uh, and health. He was a former editor of the Health and, and Human Rights Journal. And uh, he is now writing a book called Marks of Contagion, How Bubonic Plague and Mediterranean Quarantine Inspired the Neoliberal Security State. And, uh, uh, and Rob Yates, who is well known to many of you in this room, is an internationally recognized expert on universal health coverage and progressive health financing. And he works at Chatham House as a project director of the UHC Policy Forum. You know, Rob, of course, as you, you, you can read, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's worked as a senior health economist with the UK's Department for uh, International Development. He's worked for the World Health Organization. You know, he's advised governments throughout Asia and Africa on, on health policy uh, and health systems. But I think he's really best known uh, in our circles for highlighting the fact that user fees uh, killed three million kids over 20 years in, in Africa and really convincing uh, the UK government and others to stop, uh, you know, to push to stop those policies. So, you know, really a, a hero in, in that in that area and uh, somebody who understands these issues very well. So let me call on, on Aaron and then Rob will come up after and they will talk about neoliberalism and the architecture of global health as it pertains to this epidemic. Aaron. So, so Jean and Paul and, uh, and Is Ishan, um, were giving, you know, an, uh, uh, presenting an attempt to describe this 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 uh, tragedy and this injustice um, in terms that uh, that involved flipping um, flipping the equation a little bit um, and trying to see uh, what the uh, epidemic would look like if instead of focusing monomaniacally on uh, what was going on in the zone of incidence, if you looked outward and tried to understand um, how, how this came to be. And what Rob and I are going to um, try and describe our effort to come to terms with uh, over the last uh, year or so um, is exactly the, the, the project that, uh, that, that Gene and, and colleagues have, to, has, have suggested. Where did this come from? How did this epidemic come to exist in this way? What meaning can we make of this epidemic and, um, and, and of epidemics in general? Uh, Randy um, showed a, a, a slide that was very evocative. He said he, 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 he wondered um, what possible uh, person who's in uh, 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 circumstances that are so terrible um, would ever wonder um, whether they could whether they could have some more data. This is the attitude that um, many of the people who've come to Sierra Leone, to Liberia, to other countries in West Africa, um, have taken to um, the, the the setting in which uh, they found themselves, sitting in an armchair, removed by the the, uh, the conditions in which these people were uh, uh, were suffering. Um, and trying to intervene in ways that actually increase their vulnerability rather than addressing them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Sierra Leone specifically. Um, I think that uh, there are um, commonalities in um, most, if not all, of the countries of West, West Africa where um, the epidemic was, uh, uh, was most acute. Um, Sierra Leone is symbolic in lots of ways. Uh, as, as Faisal was, was talking about um, the, uh, the British peculiar imperialist um, vision of humanitarianism um, in which the British uh, 
exercise their empire by, uh, by interdicting slave ships, um, it uh, reminded me that in fact, the current um, uh, country, the country of Sierra Leone, that was one of the main focal points of the Ebola epidemic, um, began as the place where they brought the slaves whom they didn't compensate. Um, Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone, was Freetown because this British empire um, exercised its humanitarianism by dumping, um, bringing people uh, to, to this port city. Um, uh, in, in, uh, on the coast of Sierra Leone. Um, when uh, Sierra Leone um, uh, was, became independent in uh, 1861, um, the, the British had put into place a, uh, a, a, a number of provinces outside the capital city. Um, Jean showed uh, very quickly uh, the map of those provinces. But what's interesting about them is the law in those provinces was different. Um, in the hinterland, which they had only uh, imperial interest in and no um, pretext of, uh, of, of humanitarian uh, uh, engagement, um, it, the, the, the rule was entirely by elite families that they had cultivated um, by name that they had specified in their um, uh, in, in, in the legal documents that governed the, uh, the Sierra Leone colony. Um, and uh, those, the names of those families continued to be used throughout the early years of independence as uh, uh, legally mandated um, uh, governors of the various provinces and were in fact resuscitated by the World Bank after the Civil War in, in, in 2004. So Sierra Leone is in a lot of ways a, a kind of passion play of the transition from colonialism to post-colonialism, the transition from uh, colonial health um, to, 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 to global health. And the less, you know, one of the, one of the um, inklings that you get in thinking about the, the history that, uh, that uh, uh, Jean and, and, and Paul and Ishan were telling through the Funhouse Mirror, <laughs> as it were, um, is that uh, the, the, the direction in which this, um, this history goes is inevitable. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes uh, so that Rob is going to have time and so that we don't get... Uh, Get, get too exhausted um, uh, uh, since we have a couple of, of other cases. But I just want to talk about the intersection between uh, this ideology of cost effectiveness and, um, and of its, you know, what the, 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 the idea that uh, recurrent costs of government need to be constrained, but there is no obligation to, uh, to individuals and Sierra Leone and how um, it, it, it seems to have contributed to the, uh, to, to, to the epidemic in 2004 and 2015. 2014 and 2015. Um, right at the time that uh, Sierra Leone became independent, um, within the uh, ideology of international health, there was still a very powerful pushback against this, um, this, this notion of cost effectiveness. Um, by the end of the 1960s, I think we've been talking about cost effectiveness as something that appeared almost out of nowhere in the 80s, uh, possibly because of, uh, of resentment within uh, the United States and Britain, um, you know, against its, its, uh, its sloganization under Thatcher and Reagan. But actually what you see is that um, not only uh, were institutions like the World Health Organization already uh, taking these ideas as, uh, as, as a flag, but they were embedding it in policy. And they were embedding it in policy not only um, uh, uh, as a way of, of, of catering to um, the United States in which, uh, and, and other powerful donors which um, had adopted them in, uh, in their own right, but also making them a focal point of, um, of the way in which they were doing international health. So already by the, uh, the, the late 1960s, WHO was um, not only saying that it would be a good idea to uh, 
uh, engage in cost effectiveness analyses as a kind of sop to uh, people who thought this was important, but also um, actually embedding it in their budget documents. So in the 1968 uh, 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 main uh, uh, budget document for WHO, there's a note that says we need to do more cost effectiveness analysis. We need to do more systems analysis. We need to create a mechanism by which we, as a donor and as a, a technical agency and uh, the countries that we advise, um, can prioritize. What, you know, what are you doing when you're, when you're creating a cost-effectiveness analysis? You're making a mechanism by which you can say, well, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this. And so the seeds of what Sal uh, I think Salman was referring to as selective primary health care, which had, has had such a pro profound impact on tuberculosis care in many other areas, were actually laid here. As soon as you accept cost-effectiveness analysis as the basis for your budgeting, you're already saying that we're going to engage in selection. You're already saying we're not going to deal with healthcare um, as uh, a moral, humanitarian, and social principle. We're going to engage in it as an economic principle, and that's going to mean making tough choices, limiting recurrent government costs. And this idea of limiting recurrent government costs became, uh, you know, very, am you know, the, it was it was totally generalized after the mid 1970s when all of a sudden the budgets of um, uh, uh, of poor countries in particular became became constrained. And this is where we get back to, you know, this idea: if you only had more debt, because what was happening with the in, in, you know, in part through the mechanism of the Alma-Ata Declaration and the primary health care movement as it um, became, uh, as, as, it, as it came to be, was that WHO, World Bank, and other development agencies were specifically saying to developing countries, you need to take on more debt in order to create decentralized health units. You need to borrow money from commercial lenders. It, you know, the, the, these recommendations are written and were clearly received because, indeed, when it became difficult to uh, pay the, you know, many recurrent costs for drugs, for uh, doctors, for nurses, for other health workers in the late 1970s, um, the, the development agencies said to countries like Sierra Leone, you need to do this. You need to do this in a decentralized way at the community level. Um, and so you need to do two things. On the one hand, you need to borrow money. And you know there's extensive documentation of Robert McNamara, the head of the World Bank at the time, specifically telling countries to borrow on commercial markets. And on the other hand, you need to institute community-based financing. So in, in addition to decentralizing uh, health care, you need to decentralize the financing. What does decentralize the financing mean? It means that you need to take on more debt. The government needs to take on more debt. And people need to take on more debt. This kid needs to take on more debt. That's the solution. That's how you're going to pursue primary health care. Now, you know, we're, we're pressed for time, so I'm not going to uh, go into the, the level of detail. We've kind of fist the, uh, the, the, the genesis of the policy recommendations of the World Bank, uh, discovering in the process that they completely ignored not only very, very clear evidence that user fees were um, uh, unjustifiable, that if you impose them not only in poor communities but in rich communities, they would reduce people's um, uh, utilization of health care, which in a setting like this is catastrophic. Not only did they ignore evidence from the RAND Corporation from uh, you know other other very eminent um, and and, and well-respected uh, research organizations, they ignored their own research. They had a study of 12,000 households in Peru as of 1986 that said user fees are you know are 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 are, are clearly depressing the utilization of healthcare um, in poor communities of Lima, and they ignored it. And they promulgated uh, 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 um, a, a series of policy papers, including official policy pronouncements, which said you must adopt user fees. And immediately after the definitive policy pronouncement in 1987, in the spring of 1987, 
um, the uh, uh, story that Rob is about to, uh, to um, uh, take forward historically um, uh, burst onto the scene when UNICEF and WHO Afro, which uh, Randy talked about a little bit, um, and uh, uh, met in Bamako in Mali and created a, uh, a, an initiative to get more countries to get more kids to pay more money uh, or to, to be charged more money um, for, for their basic health care. Um, the idea was to um, uh, supply drugs to communities, to get members of those communities, many of whom uh, you were you know, engaged in subsistence agriculture, so uh, their, their uh, cash supplies were, were, were quite limited, to pay for those drugs as a way of paying the salaries of the people who were delivering uh, primary health care. And you know, what's, what's remarkable in looking at this is um, not only that it uh, very clearly contravened just uh, mountains of documented evidence about um, what the effect of this kind of a policy would be. Not only that it contravened um, the, uh, the um, uh, advice of um, the World Bank's own researchers, um, but also that it reflected a, uh, an imposition of a, an epidemic model onto the moral project of uh, healing people. Now that's the really remarkable thing. I mean, you know, the, the, one of the one of the images that really stuck in my head, um, you know, as I was, um, this is not from Sierra Leone. This is from uh, from uh, Monrovia, from Liberia. Um, uh, there's there's a a moment in the epidemic in I think the summer of 2014, maybe July, where initially there are people who are you know, being cut off by this this uh, string, uh, poor neighborhood uh, West Point in Monrovia, and you know they're asking to be let out. A day later, this photograph was taken. You see the way in which the mechanisms that that Jean and Paul and Ishan are are describing um, move from symbolic quarantine to a very, very hard and, uh, and, and, and aggressive and violent um, imposition of the state. And that same violence is clearly visible here. I really, you know, the, the last thought I want to leave you before I let uh, Rob take the story over um, is that, you know, the quarantine in Monrovia and this quarantine here of one person asking uh, wordlessly for something other than data, and one person offering them debt. It's the same quarantine, and I, you know, one of the things that that has been really striking to me in in pursuing this project with Rob and with uh, Salman and with 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 Paul and with others, um, you know, is just the way in which these two kinds of quarantine converge. Not just converge in a kind of symbolic, metaphorical way, but in an institutional way. You know, the, 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 the running, it's not, it's not really a joke, it's a way of expressing anger, right, Gene? It's, it's, it's a way of kind of domesticating, you know, the outrage that you're, uh, of the situation that you're describing. But they're really the same institutions, and it's the, really the same institutional framework, and it's really the same justifications, you know, that put one person on one side of this um, running open sewer and, and another smaller person on the other side. So anyway, those, those, those are the thoughts that I had that I'd like to, uh, to introduce Rob's um, uh, uh, description of what happened in the domain of user fees, um, what happened to the Bamako Initiative, and, and, and maybe a little bit what is to be done about it and what lessons we can learn from, uh, from, from, from this history. And thank you so much for inviting me back to, to Harvard. I think it was about six years ago I worked out that I was here last talking on this uh, topic. And, and uh, um, it's, I think it's a good news story, actually, in, in many respects, because six years ago, uh, I think we were just seeing the transition and, and that, that really we've seen quite a dramatic move away from healthcare user fees um, over, over recent years. And, and I'm going to perhaps 
um, talk about that, and, and but really to say that the job still isn't really done. Um, as Aaron was uh, describing there, it, it really was ideology that drove the whole use of fees uh, um, agenda. And you can sort of see it in the, in the World Bank publications of, of the 1980s. And a lot of it, of course, due to structural adjustment and uh, trying to justify keeping a lid on public expenditure. The whole drive was to keep the lid down on public expenditure um, and pass the financing burden of health and education services, water services, onto the population. Of course, the argument being that to have a sort of a lean, mean state and, and low levels of public financing would enable the private sector to flourish and then you'd have trickle down and everything would be wonderful. Um, but of course, you know, we, we know that was absolute uh, nonsense. The whole um, introduction of user fees was this uh, ideological drive by economists. And um, that unfortunately, the, this whole ideology really sort of swept uh, through development policies in, in the 1980s and 1990s. <laughs> And it really was the case, um, I suppose, really at the, uh, the the turn of the decade, turn of the century even, uh, that it was just assumed that people should pay. People should pay for their health services. Uh, and I just want to sort of show you an example of just, just how how bad things got in terms of uh, this, this, this assumption. Um, now, this, this is um, one of these infamous willingness to pay surveys, you know, sort of asking people how much would you be prepared to pay for bed nets or your, your children's health. And, and this guided a lot of the, the, of the policies. And now, this is one I sort of stumbled um, across. I think this was a few years later. Um, and it was to justify charging for bed nets in Somalia, one, one of the poorest countries in the world. And there was so much of this pseudo dodgy science around about sort of, you know, how much they should charge. Now, this is a graph, and where these two lines intersected, what, one which is asking people how, what, what price is too cheap for a bed net, these graphs coming down here, and then asking what's too expensive for a bed net, and somehow where these lines crossed was they came up with $2.10. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any justification for, for this graph whatsoever, but it sort of looks good. Except I was sent this, and I thought, this, this is a bit suspicious, if you ask me, that... that Everybody who was asked was sort of saying that a, a thousand shillings was too cheap for a bed net. Everybody being asked was saying that you know that you know that, that you should be charging higher than that. And I thought this this is a bit odd. So I forced it out of PSI to sort of send me the whole survey mechanism, and they sent this screener questionnaire that, that was was being asked, and. You can see it sort of starts, I think, with a sort of reasonable question that, you know, are there any children in the household? You know, okay, fair enough. You want to sort of get this subset of people with children. Do you know what a bed net is? Well, you know, it's, that's sort of a slightly odd question, I suppose, but, but you know, you, fair enough, you might say. But then the absolute killer question, and, you know, th this was how this was working. Are you willing to purchase a mosquito net? Yes, no. And if the answer is no, reject the candidate. You know, your your view is absolutely worthless. You know, so so this this was this was how it was working those days. You know, that anyone who sort of would you know like say, well, I think they should be free. No, we're not interested in your views whatsoever. You know, that, that's uh, and that was what we were. That's what we were dealing with. Now. Um, that was really um, accepted, I, I would say, by all the major agencies, WHO, UNICEF. I was working for DFID at the time. And um, it was very kind of you, Salman, to, you know, to say that I've, I've been involved in this. I, I must say that around 2000, I was the, amongst the masses who was being duped by this rubbish. And, and you know, I was working in the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And um, this whole issue of user fees just wasn't being raised at all, uh, shamefully. But what changed, and I, I think, you know, that we got into this mess through economists, right-wing economists in the World Bank misleading us. But the good news, um, in terms of how do we get out of these situations again, the story about how you, we've moved away from user fees, I think has been much more about politics and people just saying to their political leaders, this is rubbish, we want free healthcare. And this was something that fell in my lap in, in, in Uganda, where we were sort of doing uh, pricing things based on this type of stuff. Um, but 
in the lead up to a presidential election, the president was asking the, the, the people, what can I do to improve your lives? And it was coming out loud and clear, we want free health care. You brought us free education at the, the, the uh, previous election, we want free health care. And in this most dramatic, uh, certainly the most dramatic th thing that's happened in my uh, professional life, um, President Museveni scrapped all health care user fees throughout the entire public system 10 days before the presidential election. And we in the Ministry of Health knew nothing about it. And it was really shocking. We thought he'd gone mad and, you know, that the, this was a really stupid thing to do. But it was clearly an absolute stroke of genius. Um, this, this sort of shows a graph of, uh, this was a district in southwest of uh, Uganda, uh, where you can see that it, it, but, but utilisation just doubled overnight. Now, we were working off World Bank research. I remember Hutchinson et al, who had done a willingness to pay thing, and it said that if Uganda were to remove healthcare user fees, the increased utilisation by the poor would be 2.3%. Um, and, yeah, all right. And, but you know, it doubled overnight and then it just kept, kept on going up. And what was interesting, the reaction of World Bank and WHO, they, they were just outraged that, 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 that people, the president had ignored their advice. Uh, the, the bank director even said that the, the health sector should have their budget cut as a punishment for having uh, sort of done, done this. And we well, didn't know anything about it. Um, but WHO and the bank set about doing research to say, um, Try, try and prove that it was rich people somehow were, were sort of now consuming the free health services. But then the research came back, two papers that we put in, in the report uh, showing that it was massively pro-poor. It was people who were previously excluded because of the price who were now coming. I mean, it sounds blindingly obvious, doesn't it? I mean, you laugh at it now. You know, who were the people who weren't coming? The people who couldn't afford the services. But uh, th this, you know, it was, it was striking. Now, then, um, but then I, I think what's very significant, uh, I think there was then a sort of lost five years. This had happened in Uganda, but then, you know, around Africa, nothing really happened for about another five years. Zambia then removed user fees in 2006. Uh, Burundi did for pregnant women and children in 2006. Ghana for pregnant women in 2008. Nepal in 2008. And each time again, it was led by politicians. Uh, I think they were being made aware of this now. You know, this, this sort, of, uh, sort of certainly was sort of doing the rounds in, in Africa. But the reaction of the international community was absolutely lamentable because they were, they were aware of this. Um, at the time, Uganda was a sort of a donor darling. Everyone was coming in seeing what was going on. We started to, when seeing these results, to sort of start to, to really uh, sort of put this out as, you know, wow, look, look at this. We've got it horribly wrong on the user fees. But were just sort of resolutely uh, ignored by the World Bank. And in particular, the, uh, the people putting together the World Development Report of 2004. This was called some making services work for the poor or something. And um, a number of the, uh, the people who wrote that had been the architects of the Bamako Initiative. Uh, Rudolf Nippenberg and Anya Suka uh, had been involved in this in West Africa. And, you know, they were sort of writing the, the World Development Report really saying that it's a good thing for people to be paying because they value the services they pay for. Now, um, we, you know, what, we, what we've seen, though, that, that not only was it in Uganda you got this huge surge in utilisation, this was the scene at the, uh, the children's hospital in Freetown, the day on Independence Day, the president, Sierra Leone, abolished user fees. Again, massive crowds, so, so that during the 2000s, this was happening all across Africa, but the international organisations, I think, were, were just tending to ignore it. Um, I've included here just, just a couple of slides now to illustrate the, the extent to which uh, the World Bank in particular du during this period was clinging on to the ideology. They, they were sort of pretending that they were taking into consideration this uh, evidence, but they just blatantly weren't. So the World Development Report of 2004 had this idea there's no blanket policy on user fees. They were now sort of aware there was a bit of a hot debate going on. And they did this flow chart to sort of, um, to sort of as a decision thing, to help people work out where it's appropriate to charge user fees and where it's not. And I remember this report coming out and 
uh, going through it, and, and of course I was by this time very anti-user fees, wanting to get to the box where it says you don't have to charge user fees and finding it practically impossible. And I couldn't work out why, you know, these questions were leading me here, but you can see some of the, that still the logic being used, saying, can you identify poor people and non-poor people? And if you can do that, what they're saying as well, what you should do is give those poor people some money and charge user fees. Now, we know that's an, that's an insane thing to do because, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to go and spend the money on health services anyway. And all the asymmetries of information, you, you do not do that when it comes to health services. But so you find yourself in the user fees box there. Um, and um, but, but was there any evidence that without a team of 500 sociologists and social workers that you could distinguish poor people from non-poor? I mean, we're, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, why, why, who could do that? I know, yes, let alone, you're absolutely right, Paul. You know, practically, it's impossible. And, and that the, and also that the, um, because people's life, uh, people around the poverty line, they might have a good harvest and they go above the poverty line. And I mean, you need a big team yes, them. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the costs, the costs average. involved in that, and of course, this was the this was the great fallacy of the whole exemptions idea. That you know that you could exempt poor people and identify them. That was the, the basis of a lot of the user fee stuff, which we all just took. Well, a lot of people took at face value, but was just absolute nonsense. You know, so. so that, that, that was a, a sort of a, both a practical and a logical flaw uh, that, that sort of uh, misleads you there. Um, and Can I ask one more? Yes, sure. I may have missed this because of my absence. And, and I mean, I know I have a discussion. But is there any evidence that the user fees served any purpose other than keeping people away? Meaning that they you could finance part a significant part of a budget of a clinic, private, public, whatever, with those user fees. I, again, that was one of the arguments put forward as to you know why you should charge them because it's a good source of revenue, and the expectations were that it was going to raise quite a lot of revenue, but the evidence was it was very little. That, that typically only about I think Lucy Gilson did a paper showing that across Africa it was they were tending to raise about five percent of the of the, of the government's so, budget so Rob, if I can, if I can break just in, didn't really raise any money if I, can, if I can break in here and I think this goes to, to Salman's earlier um, earlier uh, presentation of, of, of blind spot um, all development agencies knew that revolving funds did not work in poor communities yeah. the revolving fund model that's the basis of the Bamako initiative um, had been debunked conclusively by USAID in the agricultural setting. In 1985, there's a long policy paper by uh, Lieberman, I think, you know, saying, you cannot make this work. It's completely non-viable. This is two years before the World Bank recommended and UNICEF and WHO accepted this charge of creating exactly the same kind of mechanism <coughs> in the area of drugs as if you know, somehow this much more complicated, much, you know, harder to sustain uh, uh, economic system would be more viable over here. So it's, you know, it, it, it really required, um, at best, uh, you know, a, a lack of familiarity with the terrain and at worst, a, a willingness to completely ignore. And, and just to add to what Bob's saying, you're saying that the Trumpists have collected 5%. There were, by this point, you're talking about studies that showed that managing you know, screening people in and out was costing more. So collecting the money, managing the money, and doing the screening was costing more than what was being taken. And, and you know, increasing corruption and blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm just saying, is, is, there a, is there a single shred of evidence, and I'm looking to the historian, which Aaron is one, since it, it is so... There was one paper from Cameroon that sort of suggested, but it was one of those, th in, a, in a situation where public financing was in free fall, and, you know, the, because it was just drying up, and the government budgets were being retained at the centre, that, that health facilities that had been getting resources were now getting nothing in places like Cameroon, the peripheral health units. Prior to Bamako. Prior, prior to Bamako. Now, when you allowed <laughs> facilities like that to charge fees, then they could buy some commodities and, and you know, that people would come. So, but it was that one particular paper that, that I can't remember. There were, there, were three country, there were three papers in the, in the Rick, you might know this. There were three papers in the 80s before Bamako was accepted yeah. that, that were done in very small settings that suggested 
that it might be helpful, but they were really not done on the ultra poor. They were done in more middle to low incomes, and and so that's what was one of the drivers that people said, oh, well, this is going to work. Yeah. You know, so there, there was a, when you say a shred of evidence, there was barely a shred. That is true. Yeah. But it was all all based on, and really, it, it, again, it's it's this this dodgy uh, um, decision tree thing that that. This, this was the real killer one, where they asked the question, will services be adequately delivered without user fees? And, you know, what, knowing how poorly facilities are functioning, lack of health workers, lack of medicines, you, you sort of, you're sort of forced to answer the question, well, yeah, you know, we could definitely do with some more money, couldn't we? And then you're straight into the box saying, you must charge user fees. And, of course, what it's not saying Charges is... Necessary evil. A necessary evil. Partly right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the... the, the <laughs> As, and as well, which is really bad, there's no suggestion that just say maybe taking another five or ten dollars to be able to buy a few medicines, but at the expense of excluding virtually the whole community is is a good deal. And that that is that's wicked that one. And, and, and you know that so, uh, but then even you sort of get down here, and this is this other chestnut, you know, sort of will service be overutilized if uh, without <laughs> use of fees? And again, the sort of the, the absolute assumption is that if you provide free health services, people are going to go and overconsume them. You're always popping over the NHS. Absolutely. You know, when, when, <laughs> when my kids are bored on a Saturday afternoon, they're, come on, kids, let's go down to the health centre, and you know, you get some injections and some medicines. You know, it's it's great. The NHS, we were all there there all the time. You know, uh, it's just nonsense, absolute nonsense. And and so uh, again, you're, you're down charging user fees, and then I think if. Absolute miracle! You manage to, you know, really think this through and end up. They don't say anything about free health services. It's in primary education. Okay, free education, but nothing else. So, under this sort of guise of, it's just absolute <coughs> rubbish. This, you know, sort of. But this was, you know, it's really driving policy. You know, right through to about two thousand and seven in the bank. So there was sort of that that decade and the battles we were having. Um, you know, and, and sometimes I would go with the delegation. I remember one particular uh, event in South Africa where it was about health financing in Africa, and I went with the team from the Ministry of Health in Uganda, and we were saying this is nonsense, and we were ridiculed. You know, they, they, we were given a really hard time um, by the people in the, in the bank over this. So, so you know, it was it's scandalous. It took them so long. Um, another organisation, um, i just sort of come back a bit, UNICEF, um, which, of course, had bought into the Bamako initiative, taking the, all this nonsense, realising there were problems with it, and sort of trying to sort of come up with this idea, we're going to put a human face on it, call it the Bamako initiative. And, um, you know, if we put the word community in front of it, you know, then, then somehow it's all going to be great and everyone's going to rally around together and it will be fine. So the Bamako initiative, you know, we've identified was, uh, was an absolute disaster because, you know, the, the revolving drug funds really sort of operated as a rationing mechanism that those people who could afford the user fees could get medicines. But really, the tactic was to keep the masses out and, you know, you know protect the services for, for, for the better off. Um, and again, you know, UNICEF took a long, long time to sort of um, get their act together on this. And in the State of the World's Children Report in 2008, so e even later than this, they had this great box celebrating the Bamako Initiative, this great success, uh, talking about Guinea and Mali, and uh, I think there was another country that, that had performed really well on the Bamako Initiative, but were even more confrontational, and, and they criticised organisations like Oxfam, Save the Children, PIH, for daring suggest you should get rid of user fees. Now, at that point, Oxfam Save the Children went off the deep end and wrote to uh, Anne Veneman and said how outrageous this was. Jeff Sachs ploughed in as well. And UNICEF, to their credit, and, and you know, I'm quite happy to name uh, positive names, Pete Salama did a great job. Um, he's, of course, at WHO now. And, and you know, he, he knew the use of fees were a really bad idea. And he called a consultation meeting in New York um, of the various actors. So, so a number of us went, I'm not sure who else was at that meeting. It was an amazing event. Um, and it was, we, we fought for two or three days and then sort of came up with this policy position. It's not perfect, but it was making the point, and I suppose with uh, UNICEF in mind, that, that uh, women uh, of reproductive age, I wasn't very happy with that, but, um, and children should at least get free health services.
This got um, the directors at UNICEF at the meeting would seem quite happy with this. It went to Anne Veneman and she said, no chance. You know, we, we're not going to we're not going to sign up to this as a position. But interestingly, this position then did get taken up in the secretary general's um, policy on uh, women and children's health. So that that was this move that at least we should be providing services free for, for, for women and children. Uh, so that was 2008. 2009 was the big year that, that, that really, I think, sort of sealed this. Uh, when um, there was a particular was an event at the United Nations General Assembly, uh, chaired by Gordon Brown, the, the, the British Prime Minister, with uh, Zelik from the bank. Margaret Chan was there. But most importantly, six heads of state from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nepal, Burundi, and Malawi, all made statements saying they were going to remove user fees, provide free health services, maybe only for sort of certain cohorts of the population. Um, and this was the speech by uh, Gordon Brown, part of it, saying, I think we should be honest with ourselves. During the 1980s, bad development policies and bad development advice led to many poor countries to charge user fees. Um, <coughs> And, and really trying to put some cost on this. So, you know, so, so this was been a report in the, in the, in the BMJ uh, saying that about a quarter of a million African children a year had died because of this policy. So you multiply that up by 20 or so years and, and you, know, you can see the scale of this um, in terms of the, the unnecessary deaths. And he said, you know, the evidence is stark, the reality is shameful, uh, the death toll can be counted, the pain is incalculable, so today we must end to act this pain. I think that was a pivotal moment in, in this debate. Um, the president of the World Bank was sitting next to Gordon Brown, smoke coming out of his ears that, you know, that he was being sort of, his organisation was being humiliated uh, this way. Margaret Chan spoke out passionately saying that, that user fees uh, punish the poor. Um, and that was, a, you know, that, that was a, a, a sort of a great change. Um, and subsequent to that, um, you know, sort of Jim, uh, Jim Kim, once of this parish, of course, you know, sort of, when he took over at the World Bank, um, very sort of early on, realised that, you know, that it was about time the bank took a new position on this. And in his speech at the World Health Assembly, said that user fees were both unjust, obviously because of the impact on the poor, and unnecessary. They're useless financing mechanism. Mm. Um, and I, I think, you know, that that was, a, a, again, a very, very key moment in, in the debate. And you know the the bank has been sort of much sounder on on that that policy um, ever since. So um, and I think that you know the good news now is that we have got this um, movement on universal health coverage, which is really explicitly about replacing out of pocket expenditure with public financing, moving away from private voluntary financing where people buy and sell health services uh, like other goods and commodities, uh, to um, a service that's it's much more publicly financed out of compulsory mechanisms like social insurance and, and tax financing. So that's, that's really great. You know, the, the, I think there is that consensus now. It's very difficult to find anyone who will stand up and support healthcare user fees. I mean, they're, they're a rare breed. And even, even the architect of the whole the thing, you know, David DeFranti, who was mentioned, I think, in the paper this morning I saw, um, who, who had been one of the architects of this, um, in, in this sort of article in The Guardian, um, recognising, you know, the movement to universal health coverage, uh, admitting that he, he did no longer believed in user fees. Uh, and this was, a, this was an article in The Guardian, noting just how significant that was, that that, uh, that position's changed. So that's the good news, but I'd love to say that's the end of the story, but it isn't. And um, I'm really sorry to sort of have, the, you know, this really sort of shocking image and, and a shocking story. This, this happened only last year in Cameroon, which is still in effect um, um, implementing the, the, the Bamako initiative. Um, a pregnant woman would, uh, was turned away from this hospital uh, because she couldn't pay and um, she needed a cesarean section. She then went home and got very, very sick. And her, uh, it was unclear where she died. But um, on the internet, you can even see, if you've got a stomach for it, this poor woman 
uh, her, her niece tries to do an emergency cesarean section on the steps of the hospital with a razor blade, um, with, with them not letting her in, uh, both the twins died. And this led to uh, riots, or at least demonstrations, in Yaoundé um, after this. Now, this, is, this only happened fairly recently, and this, is still, this type of stuff is still continuing through West Africa. Um, and in fact, you know, great, great swathes of, of, the, of the developing world. And obviously, this is a terrible, terrible situation. I mean, when something as bad as that happens, you know, you, you really feel that the health workers involved should be in jail. You know, how, how can you let that happen on the steps of the hospital? But it goes further than that. And I think, I think in terms of discussions about accountability and, you know, that, that uh, really sort of trying to sort of uh, bring redress for this type of stuff, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Finance that allow this to happen, you know, sort of they are culpable as well. But so are the international organisations that set up all this mess in the first <laughs> place. And I, th I think the fact that a number of the people who created this mess have gone on to sort of quite successful careers in, in these organisations and are still employed by them and have been tiptoeing away from this. You know, the, the, you, but UNICEF is still to make a public position on, on this. They still won't you know, uh, retract what they said on, on the Bamako initiative. Uh, so I, I think, you know, this is where we're at at the moment. We're also just about to publish a, um, a paper from Chatham House illustrating that, that in Cameroon, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, you have this phenomenon of people who get into the hospitals but then can't pay their user fees are being detained for, for, for months on end, some of them, I mean, basically being kept hostage until they pay their, their user fees. So there are massive human rights violations still going on with this ludicrous policy that raises no money but just excludes the poor. And so, you know, I, I think we've still got our work cut out to, to finish this off once and for all. <coughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Rob, Rob can I... Can I... Um, I guess I missed you guys. And I'm, I hope it's okay for me to ask another question. I'm catching up. Um, you know, the, the Paul, I just and maybe this is better addressed to um, ethnographers of the residual impact of this, you know, unapologetically promoted policy. And I mean among caregivers, right? Um, because the, there's a triumphalist story, and you're very careful not to tell it that way, that we've made these policy changes, and because now it's our peers and friends who are in the policy-making roles who, are, who, who do, you know, issue triumphalist narratives. But what, what if, I mean, the, what ethnographic evidence do you have that those have been taken up in the hearts and minds of people conditioned to think that, again, people value things more when they pay for them. I mean, the, the, I, 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 as, a, as a provider, as a clinician, in, you know, I, just, I don't see any evidence, you know, unless, of course, user fees are removed and it becomes illegal and it, you know, you're punished, et cetera. But in the places where we work, I've never seen that. And, and, I, and I'm, I, is there anyone on this project who is uh, either looking at the residual impact in the way that that a, a Randy Packard uh, or a, an Alan Brandt might do um, of policies that, like the sanitarians' policies in the early colonial, you know, in the early 20th century and end of the 19th century, the residual impacts of those views of uh, of, of sanit sanit you know hygiene, mm -hmm. which is. Um, that's a historical project, and I just wonder, you know, I want to feel uplifted that these policy changes are, are making a difference. It just, it's just difficult to, to find evidence of it, whereas there's plenty of evidence that the, re res the residue is, is lethal to this day. Yes, yes. <coughs> Did you I, 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 I mean, I, I'd like to speak to it in a way that's, that doesn't lead to much optimism, but, you know, one of the, one, one, one of, one of the things... One of the I'm things begging for it. Well, I mean, it, you know, optimism of the will, I guess, you know, maybe pessimism of the intellect, but, you know, the, the, um, the earliest evidence that we found for this ideology, um, this ideology that, uh, you know, that if you pay for things, you value them more, 
um, comes from about 1490 in a Latin treatise from Florence. I mean, you know, they were, th this was a truism. This, you know, this is something that's so um, deeply embedded in, uh, you know, kind of Western um, civic mores that, um, you know, you have to address it explicitly. And, you know, that's not to say that you can't have a revolutionary moment in this small domain. But, you know, I think that you really have to confront the point that you just made. Mm -hmm. And that is that, you know, this is, you know, these are, these are, are, are pieces of, of, of a very deeply embedded worldview. The other thing mm -hmm. that I wanted to say, you know, to Rob's final picture, Cameroon has been an experiment in user fees since at least 1964. Mm -hmm. Right after decolonization, they had a policy, I, I've forgotten the French term, you know, that was specifically experimenting with charging people small fees for um, you know, for for health services. So it's not only the Bamako initiative. It's more like the Bamako initiative as the legitimation in the currently fashionable terms of cost effectiveness for something that's been going on for you know ever at least since decolonization and probably before. Uh, uh, Dara said yeah, back to Sinead's point from her research, her mm -hmm. doctoral research, right? That why would we tell these people how we feel, right? Um, or <coughs> Back to the question of Haiti and the cholera debate, you know, and the um, the observation that the Haitian authorities, and we're talking about ministerial level authorities, but also up and down, were not making a fuss about cholera, right? In other words, this internalized. Um, th this is what I see among these wonderful young doctors and nurses. They still say things all the time, and again, I shouldn't say they, but I'm saying in places, whether from, we're talking about Haiti, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, you know, people value things more when they pay for them, and that, we should be applying that logic, wherever it comes from, I, I mean, I don't do the interviews, in preventing people from util utilizing our services, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, you know, if you're in Japan and your average utilization is 14 per year, which is that is on average you have 14 visits of one sort or other, is obviously radically different if it's 0.5, mm -hmm. meaning every two years you may see mm -hmm. a health uh, professional, which is not about a doctor, is any, mm -hmm. you, you have a bigger list. So the ethnographic project, the historical project of where does this come from? I mean, we, we, you know, we want to know, but I guess the, the question I'm asking is how do we, how do we, get rid of this quickly and, it, it's it, and, and sees maybe a revolutionary, I, mean, I don't think it's revolutionary to say, if it generates no funds and it only serves to keep people away, w what is the project of accountability now so that this mm. phenomenon which you, these blood stains, which we, we know we've, it's not just Cameron, it's everywhere, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. To so, to so let's, can I let's just answer that? You know, that unfortunately, I think it is one of these. I think it's Bob Evans, the, the great Canadian health economist, who said, "Yeah, it's a zombie policy. It will never go away. That you will always find interest groups that that uh, make the association with you know that that if you give out free beer and free wine, people drink too much, and you know that the, the same must be true of medicines. Now, we know that that's not true." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that somehow that this sort of chimes with 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 people sort of uh, thinking that. But um, it's we have the same problem in the UK. Every single year, at some point, there will be some article in the Daily te uh, Telegraph or the Daily Mail saying we should introduce GP charges in the UK. People are over consuming them. The best way the best way to discourage frivolous use is to charge twenty pounds and then people will value it more and this will reduce demand and everything will be fine. Every bloody year that comes up. And no matter how often we, you know, the, the evidence is presented, um, you know, that, that debate goes on. Thankfully, um, the, the, the passion for a free NHS at the point of delivery is such that it, I just don't see it ever happening. So can, can I tell you, no, no, no. So we have to take a break because the cassette is going to finish. Okay, see you guys soon.